Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for coming. I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, if, uh, no one has, uh, of course they will. No one is a good speaker. And uh, with experienced, uh, uh, experienced speaker with a great CV, has lived through many battles, uh, starting in Afghanistan, and going through Libya, uh, meeting very, various interesting people around the world, uh, and now still working on the war zones of the uh, Middle East uh, in slightly different capacity than in the past. Uh, and uh, he has agreed to talk about uh, uh, the topic Islamism, the Middle East and Europe. Uh, uh, he uh, will hopefully give some uh, good examples uh, of what he means by, uh, with his approach. And uh, then, of course, there is going to be some time for some discussion because he said that he uh, is eager also to hear from you what you are interested in and he will try to give you all the uh, answers. So I will not be prolonging that uh, very much. I just must thank uh, Peter Motel, who is responsible for paying for the translation so everyone can understand uh, f what we are talking about and that the language is not a, a barrier. And uh, f I hope you will enjoy. I, no one want to, wants to sit uh, for his uh, uh, first introductory remarks. Uh, then I will ask a few questions and of course it's up to you. I just would like to remind you that this is about very very short and direct questions or very short, short and direct comments. A to řekl ještě radši česky. Až se budete ptát, tak je to jedno, jedné otázce velmi krátké, velmi jasné, nebo jednou velmi krátkém, ještě kratším komentáři, na který on by mohl reagovat. Takže nebudeme brát jako čas všem ostatním a necháme, necháme místo pro něho. So we will not be taking time from the others and it's going to be up to you to, to respond to the question or to the, to the comment. So I do thank you very much for coming. Uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, institution and, of course, my friend Thomas, uh, and for the audience here for taking the time to come and listen to what I'm trying to say. And I hope you wouldn't mind that I'm sitting here, you know, I won't stand there. Uh, the topic is a um, very complicated one, and uh, I was preparing, you know, for the last couple of days, what's, um, what's the main structure of my presentation here before you, but um, I've just decided, you know, at the last moment to just ignore it and try to talk, uh, I'm not going to say random, but just in a very casual way, you know, I don't want to be a very... Uh, uh, Professional. I am professional on the field, but not here, you know. I, I want to speak my mind, because there are things not being discussed before. And in certain areas in the world, it's very difficult to discuss as well, you know. But I think that's, that's, that's the first step should be taken. And a lot of people, they ignore it for many, many years. And that's why we are now in a vicious cycle, you know. Again and again and again and again. Uh, why I'm saying this? I don't know if you're following the subject in the 90s. Late 90s starts from the 1990, 97, 98, 99. There were a lot of reports, very professional ones, and even intelligence assessments all over the world. They believed at the time this is the end of Islamism. A lot of them, including very respectable uh, uh, academic institutions. With a lot of evidence, and it's, it's, uh, it's well articulated uh, uh, concepts and ideas to come up to that conclusion. But I think now, if we question all those reports, we can agree they are wrong. They were wrong, all of them. So here's the question, why? Okay, and it happened, by the way, in uh, what so-called the Arab Spring, which is, appears the uh, spring of radical values in the Middle East, rather democratic liberal values. Again, in 2011, a lot of people they start to speak about the end of Al-Qaeda, the end of uh, jihadism, uh, 
terrorism will be eradicated at least to the minimum level, the acceptable level. We can we live with it, we can handle it, we can manage it. And Islamists, and I will come later on to explain what's the difference between all of them if you accept that. I, myself, I have a lot of problems with it. But he said this is now the era of modern democratic Islamists. Again, now, this day, when we speak about the return of Al-Qaeda, uh, Daesh as well, which has created a huge state, never ever happened, you know, for the last 80 years. Like a terrorist organization managed to control the lives of millions and millions of people all the way from Sirte in Libya and the Mediterranean all the way to Mosul in Iraq. Was, and even some areas in the Sub-Sahara Africa. Which is a disaster. And the consequences of that, it's still not yet come. We will face that in the future. Like what happened in the 1990. Anyway, so I would like to start with the issue of Islamism itself. What's the meaning of Islamism? And why it's a problem if it is a problem? Or is it something good? So, Islamism in, 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 uh, in the modern days, it starts exactly, if you want an exact date, in 1928. Exactly. That's the first Islamist organization ever exist in the modern world, which is the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Uh, again, at the time, it wasn't a problem, you know, to create this kind of organization, whatever, to the extent Hassel Benna, the founder of the group, he took 500 pounds from the British government at the time, because they were ruling Egypt, and he was complaining because they gave 5,000 pounds to the uh, Coptic Christians to build a, a, uh, a church. But he took 500 pounds. It doesn't mean he's a spy or an agent, but just, you know, how, how things sometimes develop, you know. It starts as a good thing, it's, it's part of the mainstream, everybody can establish any think tank, organization, center, whatever. But he was up to something else in his mind. So just imagine, from that date, with the 500 pound, I'm sure it's now a lot of money, 80 years ago, he managed to create, I think, the most resilient Islamist group ever exist. 80 years now, I think, they're fighting for their survival, and they managed, you know. And basically, they managed to, uh, in a democratic way, <coughs> to conquer Egypt, and to rule it at least for a year and a half. So, Islamism, it's all about rejecting and refusing the state's quo. Which is, what's the meaning of statehood? means the absence of the Islamic Caliphate. That's it. Forget all, excuse my language, all the rubbish and the crap. And all. It's all about this. And people, they should be brave and speak their minds. Okay? And even in the documents, when the Muslim Brotherhood they established their organization, they made it very clear. 20, uh, 20, uh, 1924, they said the West demolished the Islamic Caliphate. Since it has been established for the last 1,400 years, immediately they say we established the Muslim Brotherhood as a reaction to that, and their aim is to bring it back again. This is the goal. Okay? And I believe, since then, from the Muslim Brotherhood, all the spectrum of the Islamists, we ended up now with Daesh. All of them, they share and they believe in this. A strategic goal. All of them. But just they have a different methods, different approach, different understanding of the world, you know, they live in and how to tackle these issues, how to handle the obstacles, when you can use force, when to use the political existing systems or if even uh, old uh, social institutions like mosques. This is the only difference, but they share the same goals. Okay, what's the problem here? 
A lot of people, they think it's only with the West. But it's not. Because that's exactly when they start the issue of a creating a parallel society to the existing one. A lot of people, you know, I was surprised when I spoke with them, they think uh, the Islamists, they are loved ones in their own societies. They think, oh yeah, they are good. Actually, their main problem, it starts with their own societies, you know, and every single Muslim country has its own Islamist opposition. All of them. Either they are jihadists or Muslim Brotherhood or what they call some, uh, themselves like political Islam. That means they don't use violence. Not, don't, they don't believe in violence. No, they don't use it. They believe in it. Anyway, so the problem starts there. Because they think the legitimacy of all existing sovereign states uh, it's, it's eligible because they are not Islamic countries or Islamic states. It's exactly the same idea used by Daesh, the Islamic State. Maybe they have different point views or different meaning, but it's, 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 uh, it's at the end of the day for me, it's still the same. And even if you analyze them, you know, you will see a lot of people, a huge chunk of them, you know, at one stage they were in, they started in one group and then after five, six years they moved to another one. It's very rare to find someone he starts with a particular group and then he's stuck with it until like, you know, 20 or 50 years or he give up or whatever or passed away. Most of them, they keep moving from one place to another. Usually when there's a crisis or a conflict, I witnessed that myself many times. If there's like a war, you will see that someone starts as a Muslim Brotherhood with these NGOs, nice smiles, God knows what, you know, I'm here just to help people doing uh, humanitarian aid. Just six months, you go there, same place, you see Mr. Humanitarian Work, a commander with his AK-47, you know, and even the language and the terms have been changed. It happened everywhere. Why I'm saying this? Because this is the issue. It's Islamism itself. We have to discuss it like, maybe we accept it. Maybe say, so, yeah, it's good. It's Islam itself or whatever, you know, and that's it. But it's, it's very difficult if we try to hide it, like what happened for the last eight years from uh, Obama administration. From my point of view, it was a disaster because of this issue. And they played a major part, okay, to create Daesh, I'm not a big fan of Trump, by the way. And the revival of the Muslim Brotherhood and all other groups. And we have a lot of documents about that as well, especially Hillary Clinton. She was a pure disaster. Okay? She's, why I'm saying this? Because a lot of people, they were there sacrificing their lives, you know? They're fighting against these radical terrorist groups, but at the same time, you find the guns reach them to kill you has been authorized by a plan, you know, signed by Hillary Clinton herself. This is the reality, we need to talk about this, so we have to decide, this good is think, or, or is it good or not? If it's good, that should join up all of us. Huh? And we'll be part of it, that's it. If it's bad, and there are bad people who need to be eliminated and wiped out on the face of earth, let's do that. This is the most important thing here. So, Islamism is not Islam, first of all. And we've said that several times to many governments, many officials, whatever. It's not Islam. If you want to deal with the Muslims, you have the countries there. You have Saudi Arabia, you have Libya, you have Tunisia, you have Algeria, you have Egypt. You can go there and you'll see the people, the government, the ethnic groups, the, you know, minority, whatever, you name it. There is a state and government. But if you pick up one group, Okay, called Islamists, and you think by empowering them, helping them, funding them, okay, you serving Muslims, no, you destroying Muslims and you destroying Islam. Let's be clear about it. Because these guys, they're killing Muslims every day. They wake up in the morning, I believe, the guys in Iraq, they don't kill Americans, by the way, you know, Daesh in Iraq. Every day they wake up, they kill Iraqis. Every single day, they don't stop. 
Same thing in Egypt, in Libya now. To get rid of them, it took about two years just to corner them in Benghazi. Few thousands, they managed to deploy themselves in a very professional way, because they are experts in guerrilla warfare. A lot of like neighborhoods completely destroyed in Benghazi. It's going to cost billions and billions. They were there just to get rid of them. Where did, where did they come from? Who fund them? Thousands of them, they are foreigners. 90% they came through Turkey. And guess what? As far as I'm concerned, Turkey is a member state of NATO. Wow. Huh? It's a shocking, yeah. I have a lot of them in prison, you know, there, and all the interrogations, all of them. Okay, how come? How, how? Just explain that to me. A thug, you know, in the middle of nowhere, you could tell, you know, just you see him, this guy should be arrested to interrogate him. Where's your documents? Where are you going? How, how come they managed to get from, to, from Syria, Turkey, to Libya, to kill Libyans? And my point here is, NATO is a member, uh, Turkey is a member state of NATO. So if I'm saying now, NATO helping terrorism in Libya, I think it's not a false statement. It's 100% accurate statement. And it can be proved with a lot of evidence, you know. So let's get back to the root of the issue. We have to accept the difference between Islam, Muslims, which are normal people, like Jewish, Judaism, Christian, Christians, whatever, you know. Everybody has his own ideology, culture, religion, whatever. That's the normal world. Islamism, it's something else. And myself, several times, I wouldn't hesitate to uh, call it as a, a part of a fascism, you know. It's, 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 it's like a fascism. It's, it's ideology, man-made, it's not religion. Some people, they study their religion, and then they think mm, they can use it to control people, to control countries, to take power. It's, it's a man-made ideology. I can take it, I can, I'm myself, I'm Muslim, but I can take the Muslim Brotherhood ideology and just throw it away. Because it's man-made, it's people. They come up with ideas, like any other uh, uh, ideologies in the world. Okay. What's their relation with their countries? You know, especially in the 70s, when they start to rise, you know? That's, that's exactly the way back, you know? Islamist groups everywhere in the Middle East. It was a total war. And they managed to assassinate a lot of leaders, heads of states, including President Sadat. They killed a lot of people. They created, especially in the 80s in Egypt, a conflict, you know, a, a very sectarian conflict between Muslim and Copts, which has never happened before. And deliberately and intentionally in Iraq, after the U.S. invasion 2003, Zarqawi deliberately, I don't know if you see the documents, we have it, it's in America now, when he wrote handwriting to Zawahiri, telling him he wants to kill Shia deliberately to create a conflict between Sunni and Shia, and he said that's the only way to force the Sunni, and he called them cowards. He said the Sunni, they are cowards, I have to force them to fight. The only way to do it, just attacking the Shia, I will create the conflict, then I will recruit more people, then I'm in business. In 2004. This is exactly their mindset, how they think of the world. So, their relation with their countries, it's, it's, it's uh, I think it's, it's enemy. We, we, we deal with them as the enemy, by the way. That's more this way. Yeah, they are Muslims, but they don't represent Islam. We don't support them. We don't care if they get killed, by the way, frankly speaking. But within the frame of law as well, you know. Thugs, they have guns, explosive, they have a plan to kill people, to take power by force. That means you need to stop them by force as well. And I think that's, that's 90% of the Muslims have been, for the last two years, all over the Middle East. Most of them, they share the same point of view. They get sick and tired of this issue. And now they start to realize, most of them, the issue is not the terrorist groups. No. Or terrorism. The issue, you have to start to talk about the, the, the motherboard, which is Islamism. 
the ideology. Someone come up with his idea and then said, okay, this is Islam and this is the only way you can understand Islam and you have to follow me. That's Islamism. And we have a problem, I tell you until now, a lot of countries in the West, especially liberal democratic societies, they fail to understand this. Especially in major European countries. They think, no, 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 they are uh, democratic people, they believe in the liberal democratic values, whatever. And here comes the Arab Spring. Or what's so called the Arab Spring. If you go to Syria, okay, and you analyze the situation there, because it's a good example even for the Muslim Brotherhood or the people they use, usually claim, or regardless of the, of the issue, or you support the Assad against the Assad dictator, not democratic, it's another issue. It's another debate. I'm not a fan of him. But anyway, my point is, all the people there, all of them, even the people they spend the last 25 years talking about, no, we don't use guns using the concept of jihad. We don't kill people because of religious issues. I know them personally. I had a lot of debate with them for many, many times. The leaders of the group, like the Muslim. Okay, why you change your mind? That means you are the same thing. You are a jihadist. You believe in this uh, tactics or model. When there's a time that you can use violence, you will use it to grab the power, even if you're going to kill other Syrians as well, not just the regime. We have a conflict with other people as well. But the problem, because they put it in a very strict religious way, okay, it's, it's not a conflict like between two different social groups, then you can take them out and you try to negotiate and you can settle the, the problem or whatever. No. They believe you have to follow them. Why? Because they're going to take you to paradise. Other people said, no, we're going to create this political system or we're going to share power. No, the other, they said, no, you have to follow me because I am the only way to take you to the paradise. Otherwise, I'm going to kill you. That's exactly what's going on on the ground. But some of them, they are very good when they, when they can dodge the system, dodge the other people, because they were like myself, like this. But if you want to expose the, your, their ideology, just go there and speak with them when there's a fire, people shooting each other, when there's a war at the hot zone. Uh, just try to have a conversation with them in Iraq or Yemen, Syria, in Libya, and you will see exactly the real face of these people. And, and, and now I would like to twist the whole thing upside down. A lot of people, they think their problem is uh, it's, um, uh, Islamists, they, they, they have problem with the, uh, uh, they said the West, they have problem with Islam or, or with the Islamists. That's exactly, if you read the, the newspaper or you follow the, the, the daily media in the Arab world, TV, newspapers, uh, even the cyber world, it's always like the West against all the Islamist groups because they are the good Muslims and they are the people who are going to bring back the Islamic civilization which is going to challenge the West. That's always their, their, their argument. Uh, and some people, you know, decision makers and policy makers from the West, uh, they get influenced by this idea. They thought it's, that, that's why they have a problem with some Islamists. Which is not true. You have to understand their point of view towards the West themselves, these guys. They think, and the only guy who was brave, you know, to make it clear and to create or, or to reorganize his group based on this was Osama bin Laden. He made it very clear. Okay, it's going to be war, going to kill people, end of story. That's it. But he was influenced in the early days by the Muslim Brotherhood teaching. But when he exposed himself and he made it clear in 1990, the second Gulf War, okay, when, America's when American troops has been deployed there to liberate Kuwait from Saddam Hussein. Okay. The idea is they believe the West influencing the, 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 the domestic politics in all Arab countries at all levels. And they believe, maybe you think it's wrong, but it's, uh, unless, unless you have a conversation with, with them or the leaders, 
you will understand what I'm trying to say. They think like maybe Obama, or let's say Trump now, or maybe Theresa May, London, she can pick up the phone and give orders to any Arab leader. Believe it or not, I've seen thousands of people like this. Just imagine to what extent their brain has been washed. Okay, we know there's the influence, we know there's small, but just imagine when someone, he was educated in a civil education, in a university, in any other country, believes strongly, no, 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 they said, these guys just, they get orders by phone. So that's why, he said, we have a problem with the West, and we will use violence, because that's the only way we can change our countries. First time this idea appeared and materialized in a very articulated and structured way, Bin Laden, in Al-Qaeda, and he made it clear. And by the way, I had this discussion with him myself, you know, several times, personally. That was his uh, blitz theory. He said, no, no, that's it. It's just a waste of time if they keep fight here and there. Let's go and launch a crusade against the West, a total war, then we can fix our role. But first of all, we don't need to fight against Libyans, we don't need to fight against Algerians, whatever, no, the regimes. Let's make it against the West, then we'll take it from there. Okay. My point here, if you go to what so-called the political Islam, the Islamists, the, the, mean, the Muslim Brotherhood, they say we don't use violence or we don't do it. Just ask them about all these arguments. Are they false or true? You will be shocked when you find out they share exactly the same ideology, analysis, concepts, understanding has been produced by Bin Laden or Al-Qaeda or other people. It's exactly the same thing. Just to make things simple, you know, because the world is more complicated than their minds, they think, no, it's, it's, it's the, the only problem is the West. Yeah, you know, sometimes other countries, they're a problem, you know, but this is a problem as well when you think, and people, they grow up in, in, in education institutions, and even in the media, they think every single problem happening anywhere in the Middle East, it's because of the West. That's, that's, that's exactly what's the meaning of extremism, radicalism, and maybe fascism. When you blame like the Americans, and I heard that myself once from a professor in Egyptian University. She was blaming Obama because of the poor education in Egypt. What the hell is this? I was said, yeah, because America must, yani, they can put more pressure uh, upon Mubarak at the time. To make sure we have a good education in Egypt. And I told her, excuse me, just a second, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Obama was elected in America to serve the American people. But education in Egypt, it's too much. Maybe you go there and ask for help, but you're blaming him. You make it, it's like an American problem because you think your education system is crap or corrupt or whatever. It doesn't make it. And she, she is a doctor. Professor at the university, not a student. This is the disease. When you think like Islamists, I can go on and on and on, you know, maybe till tomorrow. This is the, when you think like that, even if you are not an Islamist, you know, if you've been influenced by their media, their arguments, their statements, their claims, and the problem now, after the Arab Spring, they start to be part of the mainstream politics in the Arab world. And even in the West, they've been accepted in many places, you know, in Washington, in London, in Paris. They met with the top officials all over the world. They became leaders and champions of democracy as well. But the problem is you don't know, and you don't go there, and you follow them, what they teach the people there. What kind of, of, uh, of ideology? What's their doctrine, you know? In the villages, and the cities, maybe in the Zara as well, in the farms, in the schools, in the Middle East there, what they teach them. This is the main challenge. And that's why I think we lost the, uh, what's called the Arab Spring. Yeah, maybe it was a chance, okay? Change happened in a very dramatic way. But who took chance, who, who sees that moment? It's the Islamists. Either the Muslim Brotherhood, 
or the most savage, barbaric, radical group, which is Daesh. But it was, it was their moment. Why? You cannot mark by words. You cannot fight terrorism. Okay? I don't believe like there's a zero terrorism, no way, especially in the Middle East. But always there's chances, you know, to put it in a level when you can control it. Okay? It's un it should be under control. Not, not like what we have now. But you cannot do that without fixing the political sphere. Islamists, when they have influence in any political sphere, in any country, always just give them 12 months. You will see immediately the rise of radical values. And if you want to do a study about specific case, do it about Egypt when Morsi elected. Yes, he was elected. But just study that period, 12 months since he took office and then he was removed. Just study the values, the dominant values at that period. And all the channels, you know, feeding the public, you know, the, even the public sphere with this kind of value. Even the debate, the nature of the debates about everything in the media. I did follow that uh, uh, period uh, very, very well, on a daily basis. I know Egypt very well. At that time, it was a different Egypt. Completely, it's a different country. Why? Because an Islamist took power. And, and then, when he released the people now, just today, early in the morning, they fired four rockets to Elat in Israel from Sinai. He released them from the prison. And what he said, he said, no, because these guys, they are good and they're going to negotiate with their, uh, the other terrorists in Zayda. Just imagine. He released the terrorists from prison, okay, to go to negotiate with other terrorists in Zayda. This is the problem. And he was one of the top leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's, so the uh, the main idea here I would like to speak about it just to put it in perspective and it's a conclusion of a very long conversation between myself and very good friend American lady, a friend of mine she's official, you know, but she's very very well uh, aware of the Middle East and she spent I think maybe 20 years working there and still the conclusion of that, I'm still thinking of that uh, uh, discussion till now, because she's handling these issues as well, and she, has, she had a military background. She told me, look, Roman, it's the same thing. Everything people, they claim, okay, she said, we know. Sometimes we go there, we make problems, okay, we accept that. But not just in the Muslim world, sometimes somewhere else. Always people they blame the Americans about you did this, you did that, you are the cause of this, you are the reason, blah 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 blah, all these things. But she told me I would like you to be aware of something that we I cannot say in public and we don't say in public, you know. If you analyze this Arab Spring now and what happened, it was a chance for all Arabs to you know to create a democrat at least you know to start the process of a democratic political systems, like what happened in Eastern Europe after the the, the, the fall of Wolf Barney. Okay? But we ended up with a different story. She told me, we are, as Americans, we cannot handle these issues. Even if we send thousands and thousands and thousands of troops. No. But we have the right, as Americans, to take care of our interests there. Definitely. Which is true. But it doesn't mean we're going to confront Society, she told me, I think now it's not, it's not organizations. She said, I think the problem, not just organization, Al-Qaeda, uh, Daesh, uh, God knows what, G in Algeria, LIFG in Libya, no. She said, it's beyond that. 
because this number of Islamists are radical groups, okay, and maybe entire cities has been radicalized, it's beyond groups and organizations. And then she told me, look, think about it, maybe this is the norm, not the exceptional. She told me, Norman, think, because we have very good friends, I know her like maybe 15 years now, or told me, look, maybe it's the norm, we need to think about it. Whenever there are chance, huh, people they will choose voluntarily, you know, to join these groups or this, even if they're not the groups, but they, uh, 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 very easy to attract them to radical values. And then she said, we need to discuss this issue and to talk about it. Because it will keep produce more conflicts, more problems. Whenever you try to open up a society, to give people a chance for freedom, democracy, the universal values, except that everywhere in the world, you will find out the only beneficiary group from that is radical extremist groups. That means it's not Al Qaeda or Daesh or whatever, there's something has to do with something else. It's very difficult to discuss with people. My last question here, not just an answer, despite all this, who's the enemy? Who's the enemy? And it's a very, very uh, essential question because if we answer this question, then we can move. Some people, they think it's easy question, maybe because, uh, I don't know, they don't have chance to be uh, on the field or on the ground practically handling this issue. Uh, who's the enemy and who's the friends here? But I think it's essential, especially now. Who's the enemy? It has two levels. First one, we still suffer from the masterpiece of stupidity by George W. Bush when he launched a war against tactic. Terrorism, war on terror, masterpiece of stupidity. Okay, and we still suffer from that until now. Terrorism is not the enemy, something else is the enemy. You have to identify the enemy, then you can attack it. That's one part of it. Then, if you take the Syrian example, Okay, Bashar al-Assad is the enemy, but how about the terrorists there? Are they enemy or not? Okay, if they are the enemy, how come you fund operations to bring weapons to Libya, to them, and then from Libya all the way to Syria? Okay, and it's been documented in the Pentagon Intelligence Service Agency. Ten pages released by court order because of the investigation in Benghazi. I was shocked when I see it myself. Crystal clear, you know, Clinton authorized that operation to deliver weapons to terrorist groups in Syria to fight al-Assad through Libya. What the hell is this? So, who is the enemy here? Al-Assad or Daesh, or what, this is very, very important issue from the two levels. What's the idea or ideology we have to fight exactly? Is it like, uh, because when you say terrorism, it's not ideology, by the way. But I think people sometimes, they're smart when they deliberately say I, uh, terrorism because they don't want to involve in the first level I've just mentioned to you. So terrorism, that means just wait. Anyone with gun or explosive or whatever, you just go there and shoot them. Or maybe you send drone. It's very easy. But the question is, what's the motives? Who indoctrinated them? What was the infrastructure paving the way of all these terrorists? That's the enemy. It's not the gun. And I will leave it there. Uh, I'm so sorry if it's like more question and complicated issue rather a 
crystal clear ideas or normal presentations, but uh, uh, I would like to say one thing, all what I've said, it's from my heart, myself, I, I'm, I'm, I'm spending 24-7 every day fighting those guys, chasing them all over the world, so it's deep from my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you, and let, before we open it, uh, let, let me have you a few questions for short answers. You mentioned Turkey, your judgment of Erdogan. You mentioned Mursi, he was part of the Muslim Brotherhood establishment. What is Erdogan's role in the, is, on the Islamist map? Or what, what, what is his place on the Islamist map? In, in 2013, you know, I was in, in Turkey uh, discussing this issue with other uh, some of the people. That some of them they are experts, and some of them officials, including representatives from the EU and other countries as well, Americans. And there were uh, Turkish officials. And because at the time I detected something which is doesn't make sense to me, which is to what extent Turkish foreign policy now start to be driven by ideology. Okay, all of the Turkish officials at the time, they just, they won't pass, you know. Almost we had to finish the meeting. They went crazy and criticized me, how come you said that, we are very professional, it's a country, you think we are a group, organization, blah, 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 blah. It was 2013. I think today, history proved me right. Okay, so Erdogan, the biggest mistake he did, he allowed his country's foreign policy, okay, which shouldn't be, completely have been taken by Islamist ideology. That's exactly what he's is doing. Is he an Islamist? Oh, definitely. Without shadow of a doubt. By the way, let me give you something which is maybe it's uh, uh, maybe spot for your job. But a lot of people, they're missing this. Just how smart they are, the Islamists. The, the new group. It's a different issue, but it's related somehow, especially for smart people. The negotiations between Turkey and the EU. Many years ago, you know, the Turks, they conclude they were never ever going to make it. They know that very well, by the way. And I, I, I had the time, you know, to have dinner with some Turkish ministers, you know, a few years ago. They know that. But why they keep carrying on that conversation? Why? Why they kept the negotiations? And they know themselves, it's not gonna happen. You know why? If you go deep and you analyze it using intelligence approach, you will find out, okay, Erdogan and his group, they were very smart to use negotiation with the EU the 12 chapters, what up, my God, you know, like more than 1,000 people, you know, you have to comply with them. To weakening and dismantling the military establishment. That's exactly was their aim. And he did it. And thank you very much for the negotiation with the EU. That's the Islamist mindset. Let me ask about some other country, because you have named various groups and people switching the groups and loyalties, but uh, the essence is Islamism there. Uh, so. But there are also some countries which do or in the past have supported these groups directly. Uh, so by funding, and not only by funding, by arms sometimes, etc. And I mean from the Middle, from the middle East. What is the Saudi... What, what, are, what is now the situation with Saudi Arabia and Qatar regarding are they friends or enemies from our point of view in that sense? And what is their role in funding Islamism these days in the Middle East and outside, let's say, in Europe? Or how it has changed from the days, let's say, of you fighting in Afghanistan and, uh, and, and supporting Islamism around uh, and now? Or is there, is there any change or is it in the same track still going on? Look, until we, we sort out the issues I've mentioned, you know, it will be just depends on the environment. Because uh, most of them, they use terrorism and Islamist groups as tools of foreign policy. That's the conclusion of them. Islamists as tools of foreign policy. 
fund them, and I call them cheap laborers, you know, just give them some fund, some aid, a few ideologies and fatwas, and then just, you know, alas them, you know, in any country, they will destroy it. Uh, uh, exactly, I'm, I'm always saying that, you know, I, uh, I don't accept whatsoever any blame against the West when it comes to Syria. It's rubbish. The Arabs, they destroyed Syria. The Arabs. It has nothing to do with the West. They ruin it. That's the answer. And my third question goes, back, goes more into Europe uh, uh, and to the situation there. You've said that Obama has been disaster, Hillary even more disaster, but you live now in London most of the time. Uh, so we live here in Europe. What is the situation in Europe regarding the, and what is the trajectory regarding the Muslim minorities or the immigrants, of, uh, so, or including those second and third generation, those who now come to fight through Turkey and go to Syria and go to other places. What is the trend there? How do you see those societies realizing that this is cancer and danger for them, or sub-societies, uh, or how much it is, if it's a norm there as well, how much it is really disaster in making once the, if we accept that there is such a norm in the Middle East, if you put the same norm into the democratic societies, then what to do with that if it's that? Or it's not lost. Okay. Look, um, if you ask me you know, about my, my, my personal opinion about these issues, if you take into account the size of the threat, itself, because it's very important. Some countries, they don't have that kind of threat, you know, like few people here and there. But if you have millions of, uh, of Muslims and then you have uh, thousands of potential terrorists, uh, over 1,000, 2,000 people in a security watch list, it's an issue. Uh, which is the UK. I, uh, I believe it's, it's one of the most experienced countries, you know, in the uh, liberal democratic Western societies can handle these issues. There's problems, but it's, uh, if you take into account the existence of radical values, uh, the intention of a lot of terrorist groups to harm UK, uh, hundreds of British nationals, they went to fight in Syria and Iraq, and a lot of them, they joined Daesh. We have 50 kids, British kids, they are part of uh, uh, Daesh children, 50. Uh, why? Because you have to strike a balance. Okay, and here comes the difference between when I have a war in Iraq, Syria, or Yemen, and when I have a stable society, like any Western society, you know, you're not going to send a tank to arrest someone, you know, in, 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 in Manchester or Birmingham, of course. This is the point here. There you have to be very smart. But one thing I'm always insisting about in any Western country, don't give people, you know, any chance to negotiate or to talk about the political system. This is the issue. Multiculturalism, it's very good. It's a very civilized idea. But it doesn't mean I'm going to change my political system because of your ideas. Go to hell. It's going to be like this, the answer. Okay, you want to talk about cultural issues? Yeah, it's good. Uh, minorities' rights? Yeah, that's it. But don't think about Westminster political system, which is for all the British people. People against and people with anyone can play any role there, you know, but just you have to play the game with its own. But I'm not going to change the political system because you follow Hassan al Banna or you like Al Qaeda. This is the issue because I've seen people sometimes. Western officials, ah, they, they are not crystal clear about these issues. No. And you have the right, you know, if you don't like it, it's up to you. You can choose any other places. But the political system, it's usual. Why? Because the, the political system is representing the whole nation. Okay? The system, that's the system. That's how to run the country on a daily basis. That's how to manage the people. 
That's how to take care of the public affairs, regardless of your, your background. If you give the Islamist access to that, that's the end. The other problem is, yes, we note that in Europe there is a huge influence in, uh, in many Muslim societies in the West with the uh, radical values, which is a problem. And here again, I would like to say, it's not Daesh. It's easy. You make my job easy. If you are a Daesh, that means you are subject to be arrested or interrogated or whatever, you know. The problem is when someone speaking the same language but to serve a radical values, you will see these guys in Europe, even in university camps. And you cannot stop them. You can do anything. Yeah, which is, which is good, by the way, you know, but just we have to come up to a solution to this issue as well, you know. But everything has to go according to the law because it's not a jungle. But again, at the same time, it's a problem when someone sitting like here in a university camp in a Western capital, you know, spreading very radical extreme values. It's every week. I mean, in London, it's very well known issue. And we have a particular group there, that's their job. They spend the whole day just thinking how to influence university camps called Hizb al Tahrir, HD. That's their work, that's their job. They don't do anything. And they are very, very extreme, radical idiots. But they don't use guns. And they have big influence in many places. And they chase only students in universities. And most of them, the second and the third generation. Yeah. Like locusts. So the challenge here, it's, it's security just part of it to make sure everything is under control. But you know the, the, the challenge is integration. How to make sure these communities well integrated with the society. And you have to strike a balance again between what's so called community and society as well. Because some people they decide just to live within, we've seen that, you know, to live within their communities only and they're very happy. They don't want the society. Many cases they are very happy with the community, but if you ask about no, no, I'm very happy here with my community. Okay, but how about like the British society? No, I don't like it. No, I hate it. I'm against that. And then they choose, by the way, okay, like the, the NHS, the health service. Ah, they like that. Gonna, okay, free education. Ah, they're going to become... They, even they choose from the system. I don't think we should allow that to happen. Okay, there is a microphone. I just remind uh, very sharp, very uh, simple, quick questions, comments. General in the second row. Thank you. Yep. Okay, first, thanks for what you do. For, for what you do. Uh, second, do you think that the liberal democracy of Western type is always necessarily the best solution for the tribal society in the less developed Muslim country. Thank you. Nope. <laughs> hey, another. <laughs> Other questions? There, the third row. Jirka Santo. Mohta albe mohta de Ježivej? Jestli je mohta albe mohta živej? 
Druhá otázka k tomu, jestli Al-Qaida v africkém Sahelu je samostatná nebo už je zcela pod Daeshem. A třetí otázka, jestli si také myslíte, že pro nejbližší vývoj kolem vlastně celého konfliktu v Arábii bude umístěn v Líběji. Děkuju. Co bylo třetí, že na kolik je ta Libie? Jestli v Libii bude vlastně to, to, co je klíčový. Ten cíl prostě klíčový naši. To je třeba Libie, ta situace tady, jak moc to bude být ta centralita Libie. To je Arbor. Je, to je Arbor. Je, to je Arbor. Je, to je Arbor. OK. Regarding the Mukhtar, the Mukhtar, I think still now the sixth time, still one, and he will reach the seventh time declared dead. Okay. Uh, the last attack was very serious uh, against him, and the French intelligence service at the time they believed they had him. But there is a uh, not rumors. Confirmation uh, recently, um, he's still alive and he left Libya to Mali. Uh, and even there's a information about the route he took. Uh, it's not rumors, it's information, but not accurate. We have to verify this information. So maybe, maybe he's still, I think 60%, if you ask me, I think he's still alive, at least 60%. Regarding Al-Qaeda and Daesh in the Sahara, uh, no, Al AQIM, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, it's an independent terrorist group, not like, uh, uh, not Daesh, and they, um, uh, they, they have some problems with each other, but recently in Libya, there is a, um, a significant number of uh, uh, a terrorist leader of Al-Qaeda. He was uh, under the commandship of Mukhtar, his name Abul Walid Sahrawi. Um, I think about 70% of his personnel, they joined Daesh. They left Al-Qaeda and, the, and all of them, they're still in the southern part of Libya. But the group itself, it's still an independent group, Al-Qaeda, Al Al and I don't think uh, under any circumstances they, they will uh, like dismantle their group, you know. But sometimes you see people going from here and there, and from the other way around, after what happened in Sirt to Daesh, and in Benghazi as well, uh, some members of uh, Daesh, they return back to Al-Qaeda as well, because they were Al-Qaeda, and then they joined the Daesh, now they decide to get back to Al-Qaeda. The, uh, the third question, no, of course not, no, never. Libya is never going to be a, 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 a central issue to the Arab world. No way, it's not going to happen. You know, it's not Egypt, it's not Syria, no Iraq. No, it's, uh, I think Libya, it's at the end of the day, well, frankly, you know, at the margin, but just the situation in Libya, it has its own influence upon other countries, you know, which is like the insecurity, you know, the absence of stability, that's it. Which is going to cause problems in, in, in uh, especially Algeria, you know, more than the others. Algeria, they're very, very concerned about the situation because they have their own problems and they expect something to happen in Algeria itself, which is, they said, second wave of Arab Spring. Uh, and they think the situation in Libya, it might... Uh, speed up that uh, that process, you know. But Libya, I don't think it's uh, it's 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 important, even from the oil perspective or whatever. I don't think that uh, an issue. Uh, what is important about Libya? It's a geographical place, I believe, especially to the west. Okay, it's it's the geography, not the not the wealth. Okay, it's good, but it's it's not Libya more important because of its geography and place, rather its wealth. It's probably hard to advise or to give advices to President Trump, but uh, let's say uh, 
Defense Minister, Secretary of Defense Mattis, what would be your advice now what to do in the Middle East for the U.S. in the coming two or three years? First of all, is he, is he going, to get, going to pay me for this answer or not? He will. <laughs> <It's a laughs> we can share them. Okay. Uh, I think it's it's um, they, they they need to to uh, I'm not going to say delink. It's a harsh term to use from the old strategy of counterterrorism in the region. Okay, they but they they must uh, stop and abandon and revise all the old strategies has been implemented by Obama and Co. mainly Clinton in, in in the region. But it doesn't mean that they have to go crazy as well, they, because you know it's uh, uh, some people you know around Trump and the administration uh, they raise a lot of concern everywhere in the world, not just in, in the Middle East. Uh, not because they are smart, but I think because their motives, it's more ideological and emotional, rather a, a, a motives of a professional uh, advisors or foreign policy uh, decision makers. Uh, and I think uh, one of the biggest mistakes, which is I believe they're going to do, I hope I'm wrong, but I think they're going to do it. They will uh, make sure the U.S. will have a more significant heavy military presence uh, in the region, especially the, the eastern part of the Middle East, around Syria and Iraq. They will, uh, they will send more troops there, and it will be noticeable. You know, I, I think that's a mistake. Uh, and always the same mistake again. When you talk to people, said no, 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 no. This time we're going to do it in a good way. You know, oh, Obama because of this. It's the presence itself. You know, you need to be very smart how to do it. Too much troops there, and they will involve. And the reason because of Daesh. Uh, that's that's their main concern now. They said we need to destroy Daesh. That's it. Uh, and they think they cannot do that without heavy military presence of U.S. Per military personnel in the region, I think that's going to be a big, big mistake. So what should be done? To use the special forces as they are being used, uh, more kinetic strikes, but relying on the local fighters from whatever group there is available? No, you always need that, you know, the special forces and the Kinect corporations, it's, it's, it's always, and I think it's, um, it's a very uh, effective and positive uh, tools. I mean, even during Obama administration, you know, it's, uh, he managed really to uh, at least to stop the process of the growth of Al-Qaeda, you know, in, in, in a period of two years, I think from 2000 and, uh, 2008 until 2010, they took out about 30 top leaders of Al-Qaeda, including Bin Laden himself, like mid-level and high-level, which is a disaster for any group, you know, 30 leaders in two years. That's a disaster. And it will stop them. But it's, it's not going to end or bring an end to the, uh, to the organization. No, I think, I think, look, No one can solve the problem without having the regional powers, you know. The locals there, the countries, and you have to agree with them on a strategy. But if you cooked in the US, and then you send your troops there, and you start to play, you know, like foreign policy, uh, it's not going to work. And I think this is the story for the last 30, maybe 40 years. It's the same thing, you know. But just you have to, to engage with them in a positive way, uh, to come up with a conclusion how to put an end to this conflict. And as if you ask me, if they start with terrorism only, I can guarantee to you from now, you know, it's not going to work. It's not going to work because the ideology is still there. The ideas, the concepts, you know, it's still there. So let's take three questions. Uh, 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 uh,
jak se chce postavit tomu, že zatímco džihadisté dělají pokus o převrat násilím, tak ti umírnění islámisté jdou přes politiku a například v Evropě ovládají v některých zemích možná i nadpoloviční většinu mešit, jak tomu chce čelit. It's half translated, I think, but if I understand it. Well, one thing is the jihadists who take uh, uh, power by force, by force yeah. and the other is uh, the Islamists who don't use force and how to prevent mm -hmm. it that they don't take over once they, for example, in Europe, in certain countries, control half of the mosques. So, uh, how to how to cope with the non-violent? Uh, yes, yes. Let's say takeover inside the Western societies. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's, 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 it's very important issue. First of all, by the way, this is a very smart question and a very important one. The, um, the famous model here to deal with it from a Western point of view is, which has allowed this to happen, to go to any Muslim community and choose who is the so-called so the leaders of the Muslim communities, you know. And then you open up a channel with them, let's say if it's London and Whitehall or 10 Downing Street, and you start to deal with them. And you think by dealing with these, excuse my language, excuse me, idiots, you think you are in charge of like two or three million Muslims all over the country, they don't even know their names and who they are. And you call them the Muslim leaders, you know. And sometimes they appear in, you know, in government events or whatever. And you completely ignored the community at the grassroots level. The, uh, first step to answer the question, you have to stop this policy. You have to stop it. Because in certain countries, I find out, the officials, they are happy with this model. Why? Because they said less headache, less problems, less conflict, and less clash of civilizations as well. So said, okay, we have these guys, we can manage with them, end of story. We are happy with this. Because if we try to go deep to the community itself and to find out exactly what's going on there, it might create a clash of civilizations and we didn't need that to happen in our society. So let's keep it as a community. And, my pro and the problem here which is really nonsense. I've seen a lot of Muslims, they think that's good for them. Okay, which is a disaster as well. Because even from a pragmatic point of view, that's not good for them. To be left out, you know. That's why you're not going to have what you're looking for in terms of like opportunities of a job or economic opportunities or even uh, to be represented well at the political system. So that's why, because you decide to marginalize yourself. Okay. Stop this cycle and start to act at the grass root level. You know, you have, it's, 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 it's not difficult at all, by the way, you know. Like the Islamists manage to control society, uh, communities by using uh, activism at the grassroots level, we can do that exactly. But just it needs someone to understand it and to stop the old model, which is, I call it, like, you know, heavily influenced by Orientalism, okay? Let's keep them in their ghettos and in their uh, uh, communities and start to act at the grassroots level. And don't allow it to happen, you know? Don't allow that to happen. Uh, always we give example and we make fun of the, uh, maybe five or six people, they appeared in 2003 in 10 Downing Street with Tony Blair, when he decided to join the Americans to invade Iraq. Okay, six or seven idiots, they appeared, you know, and just for the picture, because they need the photo. To put it like, okay, the Muslim community with Tony Blair, you know, then he ended up with terrorist attacks everywhere. <laughs> this is the problem, you see, which, which is always, I make fun of this, you know. He thought when he brought this idiot, seven people, nobody even believed in them. Most of the people, they don't know who they are. If you ask to the, if you go to Britain and you ask people, they, 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 it's hardly to recall even their names, you know. They were in 10 Downing Street, and he said, I'm here sitting with the Muslim representative. They are the, the, the leaders of the Muslims here in UK. And they said, yeah, God bless you, go and attack Iraq. And we know everybody what happened in London, you know. And this, uh, then the 7-7 attack, 
even the, a teacher, just imagine when, it, when a teacher, school teacher, he used to teach kids, he led the cell to kill 51 civilians in London when they attacked the transportation system. In UK, 7.30 a.m. in the morning, randomly, the leader of that cell, he was born in UK, and he was a teacher. He used to teach kids in schools. I am 100% certain the idiots they were with Tony Blair as representative, they don't know nothing about these issues at all. This is the problem, I told you, we, we have to stop a lot of old models, you know, old approaches, because it didn't work. It didn't work. Billions, not millions, billions have been spent from 2001 until I think maybe 2008, 2009, when all the countries they saw, especially in UK and Britain, they find out it's just a business. Bunch of hustlers, they appear as if they can solve the problems. They spend money here and there and nothing happened. Now we have more terrorists than before. Just if you take it from, you know, like business-wise, okay, I spend this amount of money and I get peanuts. It doesn't make any sense. So we have to stop the model itself. It doesn't work. We can study it, we get the lessons, and then delink with it. So the last two questions were the second row, well, and then... Uh, uh, would you think that it would be possible uh, to uh, build up uh, an army from refugees and uh, uh, so that this uh, this ar army would be able to uh, to wage uh, and win the war against the uh, Islamic State and uh, uh, thereafter uh, uh, st stabilize uh, uh, the so society in Muslim countries. Uh, no, the answer is no. Regarding the specific issue, you know, you cannot build an army from the refugees because most of them, uh, their morale is uh, very down. They are destroyed. They have no hope. It's very difficult, you know. To recruit people to this kind of fight, you need people with a high spirit, you know, and they believe in what you do. They, they should appreciate that and they have very high values to, to begin with. Refugees, they're struggling with their own lives. We've seen them in many places. Uh, and there is uh, several attempts before, by the way, you know. Like in Jordan, um, they've tried to create out of them not an army, but just a kind of a security serv police service, you know. Uh, so they, they've trained them. And the Jordanians, they said, instead of us as a Jordanians, we don't need to do security in the camps in our country. So Syrians, they can police Syrians. Okay, and then they said it's assets for Syria itself. If they get rid of an asset, they can go back, you know, to their own country and they can work as a police service. I don't think it worked. Because a lot of them, they were thugs. Believe it or not. Thugs. This is the people you're going to have. If you ask, okay, for recruitment, I think the first people they will appear, thugs. They have no value. They don't understand what's the meaning of uh, military personnel or how to serve, you know, your country in the military or to serve your country as a police service or a security service. So it's very difficult, the idea itself. Again, the Americans, they tried with the Jesh al hur twice. The most important thing, and which is really funny, we make always fun of it, as soon as they get to Syria, they hand over all their weapons, equipment, to Al-Qaeda. <laughs> they've, been, they've been trained by the American Special Forces for many months, you know, within two weeks. Just the first clash, they trick them, even they don't attack them. They hand over all the weapons and equipments, everything. And some of them basically they joined Al-Qaeda in Syria. So it's very difficult. To do that, you need the, the, the uh, a professional army, you know. Professional army. And this is one of the issues I mentioned. Like the Americans, they can ask the Arabs themselves, you know. If you are serious and you want to fight Daesh, okay, we are here. We're going to give you all the support. And maybe you have NATO involved, but we need... Arab army as well. Okay? Because it works anywhere in the world, you know. So, okay, five or six countries, let's assemble an army from all these countries and start to work in a professional way to get rid of Daesh. 
that's, that's, that's the only way if you talk about locals, but I think because of the conflicts between a lot of Arab countries, it's not the way how they appear, you know? They hate each other, they don't like each other, usually they don't want to, they don't want to work with each other, and some of them, some they think, no, because Al-Assad is first. It happened, you know? Some people just say, okay, we get rid of Daesh, I said, no, let's get rid of Al-Assad first, then we get rid of Daesh. So, we have four more minutes. Please, the last question. Dobrý den, Libar Smejkal. Já bych se chtěl zeptat a k tomu bývalému politikovi Bayerovi bych přidal ještě Sarkozyho, francouzského prezidenta a ještě asi nějakého italského politika, kteří vlastně do té Libie vlítli. Má otázka zní, jakým způsobem stabilizovat Libii, pokud to jde, protože celou Evropu tlačí tady ti uprchlíci. Já bych trošku předjímal, jestli by to byly tři slova. Ocelovací zařízení, s kterým můžeme vypěstovat pšenici, kozy a datle pro ty, pro ty uprchlíky v Africe. Děkuji. Yeah, I agree with you. What, what happened in Libya, it was a disaster. Uh, especially the, the military intervention, I think now it's proven it's a, it's a different plan, including if we would like to believe President Obama in his uh, interview, I think, in the Atlantic magazine last August, he made it clear, he said, the Europeans deceived us. He said that. And he said, Sarkozy, Instead of doing something in Libya, he said he was busy claiming our work as Americans. <laughs> like he attributed that to the French uh, military and said that was the American work, which is right, I know that. It's the Americans' work, you know. So uh, this is what happened exactly. And David Cameron had a lot of other problems more than important for him, like uh, than Libya. So just he left it like this. Uh, And if you ask me my, my, my point of view and conclusion about from what I know, uh, it was all of it, it happened because of Sarkozy's personal intentions, you know. He was responsible for that, but he managed to make it as if it's a, an international issue. And I don't know if you follow the news in UK or not. I, uh, I wish yes. It's a lovely country. <laughs> uh, there were a parliamentary report about it. It took a lot of time. And uh, the, uh, the report, the conclusion, made it clear just because they, they analyze and they discuss, okay, why we went there in Libya as Britain. They published, I think, last September. Uh, the issue of Sarkozy, it was very clear. It's an official report from the parliament, the Westminster. And he said, Sarkozy, he was in charge and he managed really to recruit everybody behind him, and he was under uh, uh, like influence of his own interest, including the challenge between himself and Gaddafi in Africa. Uh, other issue has to do about his repetition in, in, uh, in, in France itself. There is issue has to do with the defense agreement. You know, Gaddafi consulate uh, at the last moment, he was hoping for that, including the, it was between Libya and Emirat to buy Rafale. Uh, jet fighter, you know, from, from France, which was ridiculous because it was uh, very expensive, you know, it doesn't work it at all. Anyway, so, yeah, Sarkozy, he was responsible for that, then uh, he disappeared and we deal with this uh, problem. Uh, the issue of immigration or illegal immigrants. First of all, there's something very important here. They are not, li but uh, uh, always we have to respect them as a humans, okay? But the main problem they cause in Libya, the main problem they cause in Libya. Why? Because there is no state in Libya now, okay? Militias or local militias or whatever, they don't have even the facilities or the infrastructure to put them in a proper place so they don't go out and cause problems and involve in drug dealers. Okay, most of them, they, they just, you know, randomly go to cities and get, waiting until someone provide them with the means or tools to get to Europe, which is usually Italy. 
Okay? It's a huge, huge problem, big problem. Just last week, uh, there were a huge attack, a crusade against them in the middle of Tripoli, in five different places. Uh, I think about maybe six or seven hundred, they get arrested. A lot of them, they, and few people, they get killed because they were, they were you know, involved in, in a gunfight. Africans, you know, they were illegal immigrants. They had a criminal network, they involved in drug dealers and uh, prostitution as well. A lot of women as well, they've been arrested. It was a disaster last week, you know, the first time the Libyans, they came out and they faced the reality. Because it was documented in the television, you know. Disaster. This is the first issue to begin with. Second issue, there is already a agreement between Libya and the EU, mainly led between, uh, uh, concluded by, between Gaddafi and uh, Berlusconi. It was a very, very successful agreement. By 2009, 2009 the level of illegal immigrants to Europe, it was almost zero. Before that, each month, thousands, they can go there. But when they start to work on it, by 2009, sometimes a month, only two or three people, you know, they manage to get there. That's it. But because there were a real professional war between two countries, and the Italians helped the Libyan coast guards as well, with some equipment, some training, and facilities, and the Libyan, they did their part as well. But they were a state, a country, a police service, experts. Okay. Now, we don't have that. Libya. Even like, okay, Italy, uh, last week the Prime Minister, the Italian Prime Minister, he said there's a budget of 100, 100 million euros to solve this problem of illegal immigrants coming from Africa and then, let's say, invade Europe. But it's not going to work. Why? It's not the issue of the money. Who is your local partner in Libya? Who's going to take that money and make good use out of it? You see, this is the problem. It's not the money. It's not like, the okay, and we need to talk about the issue. So it's a dilemma. Like, like where we need to start to stop this issue. And by the way, now in Libya, recently, for the last couple of weeks, start to be a very, very negative uh, general in the entire country. Uh, public opinion towards Europe, how to handle this issue in Libya. People now, under the assumption, like the Europeans, they want to settle them in Libya and to stay there. Which is not good. You know why it's not good? Because it will put a lot of pressure upon a lot of officials they can sign agreements to start to move, to solve this problem. They will be under the threat of the public opinion and the problem now in Libya, because of the Arab Spring, we have armed public opinion. Not just they don't talk, they shoot. They express their opinions by shooting people. Okay? So it's very difficult even for the officials. Last week, the Saraj, you know, which is like now acting prime minister, he signed an agreement in Italy. Now the entire country cursing him. And I think it should just because of people, they don't understand exactly what happened. I, I, I can't see anything wrong with that uh, uh, memorandum has been signed with the Italians. It's just a normal professional one. I have one concern about it, which is if it allowed any European country directly to deal with local militias in Libya to counter illegal immigrants. That's a problem. That's the only observation I have uh, regarding that agreement signed uh, last week. Okay? Because it's a disaster. If you are a country, a sovereign state, let's say Italy, and then you decide, okay, I need Mr. X, my partner somewhere in Sabha. And then you decide, okay, in Zwara, I need Mr. Y. Okay, so how about the government? And what's the consequences of helping and empowering these local militias part of their work to stop illegal immigrants? Okay, they will fight illegal immigrants early in the morning, but what they're going to do with the weapons you're going to give them after 7 p.m.? 
Okay. So there'll be a different story. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, you for coming to Prague. Thank you for speaking here. We have exhausted your one and a half uh, hours. And I do thank to everyone for coming and let's uh, see you by the next uh, discussions, debates, seminars, conferences here at the Severo Institute. Thanks a lot. Thank you.